worship. Welcome to any guests who are here tonight. We're glad to have you worship with us. You can follow along in a service folder. There, uh, there's a bunch in the, in the church entry if you'd like. And welcome to those worshiping with us online. Glad to have you worship with us. We are beginning a new season of the church here. It's the season of end times. And in the season of end times, maybe that sounds kind of dark and dreary, uh, but actually it's full of hope and joy. And so we're going to be looking at the Psalms of the end times, this season of end times. The Psalms were part of the hymn book of the Old Testament uh, in the Bible, uh, songs that ancient Jews sung as a part of their worship. And so there's a, a lot of great hope and encouragement that we can find in the songs, the Psalms uh, in the Bible. And so we'll be looking at that through this four-week season of end times. Today we're celebrating the festival of the Lutheran Reformation. And Psalm 46 is what we're looking at today, the basis for which Martin Luther wrote his famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Great hope, great encouragement we'll find in Psalm 46 and the other hymns that we'll uh, sing. Uh, the Lutheran Reformation was really a time that the Lord used uh, that time and that man of Martin Luther to restore the pure gospel to his church. That's what we celebrate today. We celebrate Re Lutheran Reformation almost always as close to October 31st as we can, which is today, uh, because that commemorates the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses, his discussion points uh, to the castle church door in Wittenberg, which sparked and became the catalyst for the movement of the Lutheran Reformation. So that was 501 years ago, 1517. God's blessings uh, on your worship uh, today. Let's begin our worship by singing stanzas 1, 3, and 7 of hymn uh, 541, uh, a wonderful uh, Re Reformation Lutheran hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious God and Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice 
for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You be seated. At this time, we'll sing our psalm of the day. Our psalm of the day is uh, Psalm 46. As I mentioned earlier, it is the inspiration, at the least, for Martin Luther's penning his most famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Uh, maybe you'll notice some similarities between that, uh, uh, this psalm and, and, and that most famous hymn. This will also serve, uh, the full text of the psalm will serve as the basis for today's sermon. Let's sing Psalm 46. of the gospel of, uh, according to St. Matthew. These words of Jesus must have meant something to Martin Luther as much of them were fulfilled in his life. Many of these words were fulfilled in the lives of the disciples as they were arrested and stood trial before uh, uh, religious and secular uh, governmental authorities for their faith as they had to flee from uh, persecution. But so we see how in the lives of Martin Luther and other reformers and Christians throughout the ages, these words coming to fulfillment that Jesus has prophesied, it is evident, we live in the end time. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. 
On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let's sing our hymn of the day at this time. The choir will sing the first two stanzas and the congregation is invited to join in stanza three. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I don't know about you, but I just love a good hard rainstorm. I love to watch the rain. I love to listen to the rain. I don't know. There's just something about it. I think the older I get, maybe the more I appreciate and I find some satisfaction in a good hard rainstorm because I know that it's it's helping our ecosystem, it's helping our gardens and our farms and other industries. A good hard rain can be a good thing. Of course, a good hard rain can be a bad thing too. Some severe uh, thunderstorms can be quite frightening, uh, destructive, even deadly. Sometimes a good hard rain can be not so good. Throughout this season of end times, we'll be looking at psalms from God's Word. And the one we're looking at today, Psalm 46, is a psalm that really shows a, a, a lot of 
events that are frightening and destructive. It almost looks at, in some parts of this psalm, like it's this raging storm that is just consuming everything in its wake. Well, Martin Luther based his most famous hymn on this psalm, as I mentioned, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Because this psalm really resonated with him as he looked back on the movement of the Lutheran Reformation. And as he looked back on his own life, you know, Martin Luther's life was filled with storm after storm of difficulty. And yet it was precisely through those storms, they were crucial components that the Lord used to carry out this movement of the Lutheran Reformation to restore the pure gospel of Christ crucified to his church. As Luther found great comfort in this psalm, so there's great comfort for us in it as well. If you have a service folder and you're following along with the outline, you'll see that we'll we'll take a look at Psalm 46 uh, through the lens of the Lutheran Reformation under three headings. First, we'll look at Luther's storms that he experienced. And secondly, we'll look at the eye of the storm that Luther eventually found himself in. And finally, the eye of our storms. First, Luther storms. Uh, Maybe this is one of the most familiar scenes of Luther's early life, is that he, the first storm that Luther encounters is an actual thunderstorm. He's on foot, making his way back to the University of Erfurt after he's received his master's degree. Uh, He went home to celebrate, and he's walking back to the university. I don't know how many miles it is, but it was a number of miles. And uh, a severe storm comes up, and he's frightened. And even lightning strikes nearby him, and he cries out to Saint Anne, Saint Anne, help! I will become a monk! Luther makes it through the storm. He makes it safely back to the University of Erfurt, and he keeps his vow. He joins the monastery. But if we're honest, Well, we know that this is not the the true first storm that Martin Luther experienced. There was a raging storm inside of him that had been brewing for quite some time. And it only got more and more fierce as time went by. What was that storm? It was this. Martin Luther had no peace with God. You see, Luther had a very keen sense of his own sinfulness. He had a very sensitive conscience, and his conscience was plagued by his sins. He he was very self-aware, very introspective. He He could very easily diagnose his sinfulness almost too well. And so for Luther, peace with God was something that just felt entirely foreign to him. He tried all sorts of things to ease this conscience, to, to find peace with God. He, he tried fasting for days on end. He tried whipping himself with cords and other self-harm. He tried spending hours and hours and hours in confession to his priests. To no avail, he could not find peace with God. He could not feel as if God loved and accepted him. Luther tried becoming a monk, and he joined the most uh, severe and most strict order of monks, the Augustinian friars. Still, no peace. He became a priest. Still, no peace. He became a doctor of theology and began teaching the Bible, lecturing on it at the University of Wittenberg. Still, no peace. No matter what Luther tried, he still could not find this peace with God. And the the, the crazy thing is the more he studied the Bible, the worse he felt. The worse his conscience bothered him. Why was that? It was because it revolved around one word. There was one word that Luther misunderstood in the Bible that changed the way he looked at the rest of the Bible. What was that one word? It was the word righteousness. You see, righteousness in Luther's day was taught to people in in, in that church as being this thing he had to live up to, this standard that he had to live up to in order to be loved and accepted by God. And here's the crazy thing. When you become a monk or a priest, 
That standard goes up even higher. Monks and priests were taught that their standard of righteousness was higher than everyday average Joes. Now, no doubt, Luther had read these words of Psalm 46. He taught them, he lectured on them at the university, but they would not sink in for him. He just couldn't believe and understand how God could be his refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Luther could not escape this feeling like he was just out, exposed to the elements in a storm with no cover. Daily, he battled against that plaguing conscience of his. He he felt as frightened nearly as he did in that actual storm years earlier, but he wasn't scared of, you know, a lightning bolt. He was scared of the wrath of the Almighty God. Here's how Luther describes that time in his life. He says this, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. A single word in Romans chapter 1 had stood in my way, for I hated that word, righteousness of God, which I had been taught was a righteousness that punishes the unrighteous sinner. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. I was angry with God. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Luther continued his desperate search for peace with God, for an eased conscience. He looked in all the wrong places, but he also looked in the one right place, the only right place in the Word of God, and he eventually found that peace with God. And in the same book of the Bible that he was so terrified of before, Romans, this time chapter 3, where Paul says these words, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Again, Martin Luther, there I began to understand that the righteousness of God is the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. And I extolled my sweetest word, righteousness of God, with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word, righteousness of God. Thus, that place in Paul was for me truly the gate to paradise. Everything changed for Luther from here on out. Then, now, he could, he could see Scripture in an entirely new light. All of it, now that he knew the real meaning of that word righteousness, as Paul intended it, by the Holy Spirit. It was as if Luther had crossed the threshold from hell to heaven. And you know what? That sounds a lot like the middle section of Psalm 46. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. What Luther had found in Holy Scripture, was none other than the very city of God. This refuge from the storms of his conscience with a river running through it of of ever-flowing forgiveness. It, It was like this fortress that he found where he could take shelter from this nagging conscience. Luther had found the eye of the storm. He really had found peace with God. By grace alone, through faith alone, all because of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God in Jesus covers us through faith. Righteousness that is undeserved. 
but freely given. This is the eye of the storm that Luther discovered in the Bible. Honestly, Luther's going to struggle the rest of his life. Uh, He had such a sensitive conscience that he struggled with that nagging conscience and his own sinfulness his entire life long. He needed to constantly preach that gospel of, of forgiveness in Christ to himself. He needed to daily retreat to the city of God for refuge from his, the storms of his conscience. But now he knew where to go. He knew where to find it in Scripture alone. These three, grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone, these, these are the hallmarks of the Lutheran Reformation. Now that Luther can stand confidently on these three truths, now he has resolved to defend this city of God against any enemy that stands up against it at any cost, whatever trials may come. And come they did. From here on out, the storms that came Luther's way came from the outside mainly. 501 years ago today, he nailed those 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, those discussion points. And with that, twin storms from Pope Leo X and Charles V, the emperor, came barreling down on Luther to silence him. But the Lord intervened in history, and he intervened in time in Luther's life in numerous ways to keep him safe and to keep this preservation, this restoration of his gospel happening. Let me give you a couple examples of how the Lord intervened in this history of Luther's life to preserve him and the gospel. Luther lived in a territory called Saxony. And Saxony, of all Lutheran territories, had the most limited reach from Charles V. Politically, it was set up in such a way that he had the the least reach into Saxony. Saxony was like this little eye of the storm, geographically, where Luther lived. And not only that, but the the elector of Saxony, it's like the governor, uh, Frederick the Wise, he was a big fan of Martin Luther. And so time after time, numerous times, Frederick the Wise went to bat for Luther uh, against his enemies that were trying to silence him. Another thing that the Lord did uh, at this time in history was he kept the emperor, Charles V, overly occupied, otherwise occupied with urgent empire business so that he kind of left Luther alone during this time. He had cardinals and the pope trying to make these sneaky power grabs in many of his territories, so he spent all this time and energy worrying about them and not Luther. He had Turks, the Muslims, knocking at the northern borders of of the Holy Roman Empire, trying to invade. He had his tons of energy and, and, and time and his armies there. And France, France was, tr- was threatening him with all-out war. All these storms of difficulty for the Holy Roman Empire swirled around at that time, and yet the Lord by his grace, made sure that Luther was right in the eye of those storms, safe and secure. Now, things eventually came to a head. Uh, The Pope, Leo X, excommunicated Luther. He kicked him out of the church. That didn't end things, though. Luther was still expected to recant, to, uh, to disavow his writings, or else face severe consequences. And so as it ended up, uh, he had to appear at a meeting where he would, uh, you know, be expected to do this. Now, here's another place where Frederick the Wise stepped in and sort of saved Luther's bacon. The Pope wanted Luther to meet in Rome, but Frederick knew if Luther goes to Rome, he's not coming back alive. And so Frederick refused to send Luther to Rome. He said, it's got to be in Germany. And he demanded it. It was a deal breaker. And so the meeting, the Diet, got moved to a town called Worms, or Worms. And so in 1521, Luther showed up at Worms, and after a few days, uh, he, he made this famous speech where he stood on the Word of God. He stood on his new discovery of the purity of the, the gospel of Christ crucified before the emperor, before all seven German electors, before all these uh, 
religious and secular government authorities. Here's how he concluded that most famous speech with these words. Unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, my conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And God helped Luther. He kept him safe. He, he, kept, he gave him safe passage back home even though not long after that he was declared an outlaw, wanted dead or alive. The Lord used Frederick the Wise once again, who kidnapped Luther and whisked him off to a secret location, the Castle Coburg, where he spent 10 years. The Castle Coburg became yet again another eye in the storm where Luther was safe and secure. He spent 10 years there at Coburg under, a false, uh, under an alias, and he translated the whole Bible into the common language of the people there. After that 10 years, the Lutheran Reformation had taken great hold and it was firmly established. The Lord, though, continued to open doors for the Lutherans. He continued to shut doors for their enemies. And, and now here we stand. We are beneficiaries of that great movement. The Lutheran Reformation. Martin Luther waged war against enemies that were far more powerful than he was by simply standing on the Word of God. He stared down potentially being burned at the stake for doing so. But this was the Lord's fight. It was the Lord's time, his chosen time and his chosen man to restore the pure gospel back to his church. It was the Lord who fought for him. It was the Lord who pulled him time and time again into the safe and secure bounds of his fortress city, who defeated those enemies of him. And he brought peace to Luther and, and subsequently many, many souls after that by grace, through faith in Scripture. By his efforts, by his life, it was as if Martin Luther was confessing to the world this final section of Psalm 46 in this, this grand invitation. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the, the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. My friends, just like Luther, we are living in the end times. The global and the political upheaval, the human and the, the natural calamities that we see described here in Psalm 46, it rings eerily familiar to our own times. But, you know, ultimately, these descriptions of upheaval here in Psalm 46 find their greatest fulfillment and ultimate fulfillment in, in Judgment Day, when the Lord will destroy all things by fire and will remake a new heavens and a new earth. Looking back on history, looking back on how the Lord graciously and wisely and perfectly ruled over this time and all times in history, it's kind of convicting for us, considering the fact that we often forget just how faithfully the Lord has ruled over the centuries and the millennia, over, over kingdoms and empires, how he has constantly preserved a tiny little remnant of faithful believers in the most unlikely ways through the, un through the most unlikely people. You know, Luther would have his conscience bother him for the rest of his life. It was a cross that he bore, constantly needed that gospel preached to him. And you know, it's very similar to a, a, a lifelong struggle that I think many people in our day and age 
have. A, a conflict and a disconnection between our, our head and our heart when it comes to God ruling over our times graciously. I think in our head we know God is in control. In our head we know God knows what he's doing in our world and in our nation, and yet in our hearts, we hate the fact that we don't know what he's doing. In our heads, we feel like we have great reasons to trust God, and yet in our hearts, we don't want to trust. We want to see. We want to know. Because we want proof that everything's going to be okay with our families in our livelihoods, in our nation, in our health. And yet this is information that we're not privy to. How insulting it should be to God for us to expect this of him and for us to possibly even grow bitter with him that we don't know. Why is it that God is not insulted by this? My friends, it is only for the sake of Christ alone that God is not insulted by this. Only for the sake of the righteousness of Christ, the perfect life in this and death that wraps us in a robe of perfect righteousness. It is only for the sake of Christ who wrapped himself in our sin to die a death that we should have. As Martin Luther once wrote these words, Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness. I am your sin. You became what you were not and made me to be what I was not. What grace. What undeserved love from God. To love us and send Jesus even to us. What grace to give us the scriptures and psalms like these for our encouragement in these end times. Martin Luther was not privy to all the ways that the Lord intervened in time and history in his life. And my friends, neither are we privy to those things either. Perhaps the church of the future, perhaps the church 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 500 years from now, perhaps they will look back on our time right now and they will say, if they only knew the good that the Lord was bringing about through that pandemic, through that election, through that whole crazy year called 2020. My friends, whatever storms we face today, or this coming week, or next year, or in the next four years, we too can stand confidently on the Word of God and His promises there. We too can be still, even in the eye of the storm, knowing that the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue by confessing the unity of our Christian faith. Uh, you can, if you're following along in the service folder, it's the very center section of the service folder. We'll make use of the Nicene Creed uh, today. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Normally at this time we'd gather an offering, but we're still uh, not passing the offering baskets through the, uh, through the pews. Uh, we have the baskets located in the church entry. If you'd like to place an offering there, or if, uh, if you're watching online, if you're uh, supporting us by mail or by online giving, we, we certainly want to uh, share our appreciation uh, for your continued support. On the next page in the service folder, we'll continue with a, a responsive prayer of the church for the Reformation. We'll also include special prayers for, for this week's election, as well as for Miss um, Mandy Treder, who is deliberating our call to teach first grade here next year. Uh, following that, uh, we'll, we'll continue with the, uh, the, the responsive prayers that are printed in the service folder. We pray. Lord, our refuge and strength. We gather to worship and praise you for your ongoing work of reformation in your church. Lord, to you alone be glory. God of grace and unfathomable love, you pitied us sinners and sent your Son as our substitute to deliver us from sin, guilt, death, darkness, and despair. For your grace, Lord, to you alone be glory. By your grace, you sent your Spirit to call us to repentance. Your powerful gospel rescued us from rebellion and fills us with faith in you, the true and living God. For saving faith, Lord, to you alone be glory. By your grace, we are heirs of your eternal word and trustees of the inspired scriptures, through which you proclaim your saving truth to every generation. By the scriptures, you overthrew the darkness of those who perverted your teachings and restored to your church the message of salvation by grace alone. For the Holy Scriptures, Lord, to you alone be glory. In these last days, O Lord Jesus Christ, protect your little flock. We are like sheep living among fierce wolves. Satan stalks us like a roaring lion. Defend us from false teachers who twist your word to satisfy the latest longing. For wisdom and watchfulness under attack, hear our prayer, O Lord. Never in the history of the world has your holy word been so accessible. We only lack the zeal to treasure your restored truth with lives of faithful Bible study. For the noble character to search the scriptures daily, hear our prayer, O Lord. As we celebrate the Reformation that restored your pure gospel to your church, we also celebrate our common confession of the pure gospel in word and sacrament. For this unity of faith, we give you thanks, O Lord. We remember the faithful confessors of this and former generations who have passed down to us your word of truth. For these faithful servants, we give you thanks, O Lord. Lord, God, Lord of nations, you have made us citizens both of your kingdom of grace and of the earthly nation in which we live. You've placed us under a government that gives us the privilege of choosing the leaders who govern us. As another election approach approaches, Help us to appreciate and use this privilege. Enable this election to be free and fair. Enable the polling stations to be safe and free from harassment and violence. Whichever candidates are elected to the various offices, make the days and weeks that follow peaceful. Continue to assure us of your gracious guiding hand over all time and history, that we may trust in you even when the events around us give us cause for concern. Help us to place ourselves, our families, our livelihoods, and our health into your capable hands today, this week, and always. We pray also for Miss Mandy Treder, to whom we have extended a divine call to teach first grade next year. Bless her time of prayer and conversations and deliberation, and as you have promised, work her decision into a great blessing for your kingdom. Whatever her decision, 
Let this process increase her zeal for your house and her love for the body of believers. Oh Lord, we pray all these things in your name. And in thanksgiving for the many and amazing blessings restored to your church through the Reformation, we now commit ourselves to your care. Be our mighty fortress, our trusty shield and weapon, O Lord. We pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We'll be seated for our distribution. Uh, on Saturday evenings, we do distribution uh, chronologically from uh, the A section to the B, C, and D sections. Uh, so follow the directions of, uh, of the usher. Uh, all things are ready. Uh, come forward at the usher's direction.
And now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. All of your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand as we uh, rise for prayer and the Lord's blessing. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for the singing of our closing hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Thanks to the choir and the brass as well for uh, beautifying the worship and preaching the gospel to us. Uh, wonderful to celebrate the Reformation 501 years on the commemoration of uh, the 95 Theses. A reminder that Mandy Trader, Treader is uh, deliberating our call for first grade for next year, so uh, please keep her in your prayers as well. Um, St. John's Wauwatosa is where she currently serves, uh, so uh, I know she, she certainly appreciates that. Our Bible study on civil government continues. Uh, we have two more lessons. We're splitting the last lesson into two parts because we want to open it up for Q&A uh, tomorrow morning at 9.15. You can uh, show up here in the Fellowship Hall or on Facebook Live. Uh, there will also go out tonight. Uh, it, came out, it went out Wednesday in the email. Uh, it will go out tonight again. Um, a form that you can fill out with just, if you have a, a, a Q&A question uh, you want to pose to the pastors uh, for uh, about half the hour um, tomorrow morning will be Q&A. Um, question about civil government and 
Christians in government, um, that kind of stuff. So I believe that's all the announcements for this evening. Uh, Great to worship with everyone tonight. God's blessings and have a great week. Hi, Colette.